Hello, everybody, and welcome to our next edition of Code Word Barbalon. We're on the 15th recording today on February 4th, 2018. It is Sunday, and hello, Jörg Lisman of Belgium. Hello, Brett Norman of America. <laughs> <laughs> so we are gathered here on Skype, and we have a very fast connection. There is no delay. It's almost better than a cell phone. <laughs> I'd say it's much better than a cell phone. What do you think, Yurt? Yeah, I have no disturbing noises anywhere, and uh, Skype is working perfectly for the moment for us. So it's um, it's a wonderful start to get the reading done. Okay. And uh, to get a little bit more knowledge about um, the secret history of the Jesuits, because um, this is, of course, another book that I'm reading for the moment from Edmond Paris that is called that way. But um, the Sons of Loyola and their plans for world domination, as it is written by P.D. Stewart in Cold World Babylon, is actually the same thing. It also tells about the secret history of the Jesuits. It tells about their foundations, it tells about the Secreta Monita, the secret instructions, the constitutions, the uh, spiritual exercises about everything that is important for the Jesuits to get their education. And once they've gotten their education, what is uh, what are their orders to do when they go into the world? And therefore, of course, it is a very important part that we read the extreme oaths of the Jesuits that we have started last time in our reading. Mm -hmm. We have gotten into most of the things that have that uh, that will be said during this oath. Uh, you know, when this uh, new person of the Jesuits will be um, will be accepted into the order of the leading people. You know, of the officers, because this oath, uh, as the author said also before, and like I also said before. Um, this is not for every Jesuit. This is only for a Jesuit when he comes into a into a leading, into a commanding position within the order. And um, therefore, it is very important that we understand this. And like I said yesterday, and I don't even want to go into a great um, introduction of that on my own, because we are going to read that about what is coming. But I said yesterday, I think it was quite at the end of the broadcast that I said, you know, um, even if this oath was a quote-unquote forgery, even if this oath was not legitimate, as so many people say, well, just look at the actions, look at the fruits of the working of the Jesuits. And um, when, right. you have, when you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you will see that this is all true. Uh, yes, as, and... the Bible says, mm -hmm. as the Bible says, by their fruits, you will know them. But um, I, I, I not even go more into that because um, the book starts right away with what we are reading today on page 83 how the oath was made public it starts right away with that so um, I just want to ask the listener and the viewer of this video um, that when you come to videos of Brett Norman or when you come to videos of Juggler 66 you have to throw overboard a lot of the teaching that you have been taught up to now because most of the time you probably have been taught lies, and Brett and I don't tell lies. We tell the unbridled truth, whether you like it or not. Yep. And the truth is what is written here in this book, because otherwise we would not read this book to you. We would not teach what is written in this right, book. Right, right. Huh? And by the way, listener, you know, you don't have to rely on us for truth, because the truth resides in the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That is the Christ of the 1611 King James Bible. In his holy word, in his teachings, and the indoctrination that we've been subjected to and through the churches uh, is a very well thought out and well planned orchestration. It is no joke. And... Uh, <clears throat> Also, you should uh, check out Tom Fress's uh, Inquisition update on First Amendment Radio. Also, he does that show daily or program daily, and uh, you you should really check that out and hear what Tom has to say. And uh, I know that's my go-to place. Uh, I like to listen to Tom every day I can. So I know York does too. So we're both very interested in what Tom has to say. And we had a Bible study with him yesterday, 
And uh, that was really great, Bjork. I really enjoy that. It's uh, like you say, it's the highlight of the week. Yeah, it always gives us new insight. And yesterday yes. we were, um, even for the second time, going about uh, Colossians chapter two, the verses are from chapter uh, from verse eighteen on until the end. I think that's yep, twenty three right. or something. Just a few so it's verses. Five, it's only five or six verses, and we were speaking about that for a little more than an hour. Yeah. But um, that's how intense these studies go. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you when you read the Bible with the understanding that the papacy is the Antichrist, when you read the New Testament with the understanding that the papacy is the Antichrist, uh, the Bible reveals a lot of more knowledge to you than it, uh, if oh, it would do if you don't absolutely. have that understanding. Yep. yep. Because you see you see the Antichrist behind almost every verse in the Bible, the warning of the Antichrist, the warning of the falling away of the apostasy of the man oh, of sin. In, of, in the of prophets the too, you know, in Jeremiah and in, in, the, uh, in the Proverbs, in the Psalms, you see it everywhere, everywhere. It just starts popping up. Yeah. So and it's so, amazing. And so we are speaking here in this book called World Babylon about the Jesuits the sons of Loyola and their plans for world domination. Well, this world domination is no is nothing new for a Bible believer, because when you know the, when you read the book of Revelation, amongst other books, of course, but when you have read the book of Revelation, you know that the Roman Catholic Church will rule the world in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, um, we we only have That's to go right. into oh yes. For a short we only time. have to go into, for example, uh, Revelation 17. Yes. Yeah? Yes. And uh, when we, when we go into Revelation 17, it starts there telling us, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And now the interesting thing is that you maybe don't understand what the great whore is and what means sitting upon many waters. But the more you read the Bible, this Bible will explain itself, and it will tell you later on when you're reading what these waters are. Indeed it does, Yerk, and it takes a lot of time sometimes and a lot of, of trials through your own life and experiences through your own life and your own conversations with uh, the people that you're close to in your circles. Maybe you go to church, maybe you don't, maybe you have uh, friends that are uh, stuck in some really occultic, kind of thinking and you are sick of it i don't know you know i can't tell everything about anybody but you know when the spirit of god awakes you it awakes you and Heart. yeah yeah and it is a, a very painful uh but very worthwhile experience it absolutely is i wouldn't miss it for the world jerk I would not miss it for the world. No, and, and the point is that when you read the Bible with understanding, then you come to verse 2 in chapter 17, where it says, with whom the kings, so we are speaking about uh, the whore that sits upon many waters, with that whore with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, mm -hmm. and the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk with the wine of a fornication. So what are we speaking about in this book of uh, P.D. Stewart and in all the other videos that I do on my channel and all the other videos that Brett does on this channel, we are speaking about how the political leaders of this world sell their soul to fornicate with the woman, how they are deceiving the whole world by going into bed with that apostate church. Well, yep, a and 95% of case. all the Christians out there don't get it. And, and then it says, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So, the politicians on the one hand go to bed with this whore, with this apostate church. Yep. And the result is that the people, these rulers, the kings of the earth, rule over, are being made drunk with the wine of that fornication. What is the wine? The wine is the gospel. But this is a bitter wine. This is uh, this is acid. This is acidic. This is um, vinegar. Mm -hmm. I would like even to call sure. it. You know. Sure. Yeah. We, the people who um, who are living in this world, are made drunk 
with the wine of the fornication between the rulers of this earth who have committed fornication with the apostate whore. And this is the point of view that most people have when they come into uh, videos like this, what we are reading here, reading books like this, and they will just don't understand because they have been made drunk with the wine of the fornication. They have been indoctrinated with all their life. They got to sober and up. Yeah, this, that's right. Yeah, this is just, really you know, this, this is not this is not to point fingers or whatever. No, no God's but people need is, to sober up. That's right. Yep. This yep. is to, to try to tell you why you have probably the mindset yet that you have or that you used to have. Sure. And how you can come to the right mindset. And to the right mindset, you only can come when you are a studier of the Bible, of the Word of God. That is, and I repeat this over and over again, the Bible is our handbook for life, our manual for life. It tells us where we come from, it tells us why we are here, and it tells us where we are going. And when we read this book with the understanding and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he will reveal to us all things, as Jesus promised, that when I go away, I will send you the Comforter, and he will lead you into all truth. This is what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. And this is what the reading of the book of Revelation and the other books, and the new, and of course, also the other books of the Law and the Prophets do when you open the Bible up. Books like Code Word Babylon are actually only covering the um, the temporal side, yes. the civil side of yes. this. The Bible is a spiritual book, and it has to be un read and understood spiritually. But when you lack of spiritualism, uh, of spiritual understanding of the Bible, many books are out there in this world that can help you to set you on that path of thinking, of spiritual thinking. And therefore, you must have read books like Romanism and the Reformation from Henry Gretton Guinness. Oh, excellent choice. You must have read books like Roman Civil Liberty by mm -hmm. uh, James Edgar Wiley. Mm -hmm. You must have read books like, for example, All Roads Lead to Rome, or even the second part, Foundations Under Attack from Michael Dissemian, which Tom Fress read on his channel uh, on, on his um, on his work on First Amendment Radio and That's All right. Roads Lead to Rome, I read on my channel, Juggler 66. And you must read and understand books like Rulers of Evil and The Ark and the Dove. And when you combine all that what you are reading in these books, in these secular books, you will come to the understanding that you will have a, get a, a better understanding of the spiritual message of the Bible, of that what God, of that what Jesus wants to tell you directly. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants to warn you about that you are going to perish if you do not understand him, if you do not understand who his adversary is, and if you just are oblivious to right and correct teaching. And this is what we try to do with these videos, to educate you, not to point fingers, because right. I have been betrayed more than 40 years oh, of my life. Absolutely. Brett has been betrayed for a All big part life. of his life. Oh, absolutely. And Tom, and Tom, every time when we come together for a Bible study, he says that he is so mad at himself that he has been betrayed for about 50 years of his life. You know? Right. We, we, all, we all have had... Um, the situation that we didn't understand the truth. And Tom always likes to say, God, draw me out of my deception, kicking and screaming. Yes. Kicking and screaming. And this is what you, dear listener, also should do when you watch this video, that you, you, you don't want to accept this, what is written here, but check it. Check what is written in this book with the Bible. Yeah. And check it with everything else. And do not, some searches. Don't, don't yep. go. Verify don't, it. Don't, don't go to the <clears throat> whore itself to verify what we are saying here, because when you go into this quote-unquote system and you say, "Oh, I'm gonna see what, uh, what, for example, 
um, did Tex Mars have to say about this, or what did John Maxwell have to say about this, or what did David Icke has to say about this, or what did um, Alex Jones have to say about this, or what are they saying on the Fox Network, or what are they saying on CNN, then you will never get the true information, because all these that I've just named are whether controlled opposition or legal opposition in the mass media. Hmm. Opposition to Christ. Opposition to the truth. Yes, the but truth they're even will... worse because some of them actually take part of the truth and use it. You know, just like the devil has taken the church and used it. Um, you know, like this morning, uh, I'm just sitting here um, looking at some web pages and... Uh, you know, there's this uh, Catholic page that I was on, and I was looking for photos of the Eucharist last night. And, and you know, i just looking at the different little links on this page, and it says, the headline says, Is Christmas a Holy Day of Obligation? I'm like, what is this? So I start reading this, and I find out that, yes, in the Catholic Church, Christmas Day is a holy day of obligation. Come on on can you get more warp than that hello <laughs> because you know here i'll quote right from it because christmas is a holy day of obligation all catholics are required to attend mass on christmas day as with all holy days of obligation this requirement is so important that the church binds catholics to fulfill it under pain of mortal sin bs yeah, you know, this is what the Roman Catholic Church always wow. teaches. Outside outside of the Roman Catholic Church, there is no salvation. And to achieve salvation within the Roman Catholic Church, you have to adhere to 100% to their dogma, to their catechism, and to their teaching. Oh, and what you a have to wretched that as stench. Truth. And then at the, the, the picture they have, of course, is St. Peter's Square with the obelisk sitting there in the dark with the stupid lights on the tree and lights all around. This is so sick. Yeah, and this sure is, is what we've been indoctrinated with, and all our families are indoctrinated with it. And they love Christmas. So who are you to question Christmas? You have to oblige yeah, oblige the devil is what this is. Oblige mm -hmm. Satan, not Santa. It's stupid. Well, Satan and Santa are the same, I guess. It's the same. Yeah, it's just a switch of words. It's a, it's a, it's a really bad joke, is what it is. Yeah, and I'm not laughing. No, neither am I. But I think this is an important message that we gave our listeners and viewers of this video in the beginning of the starting of the reading of this book today cool. on the Jesuit oath. That I'm they ready really when you are. To Eric. understand that we are that we are not pointing at fingers, uh, that we are not pointing fingers at anybody, mm -hmm. but that we want you to wake up and to understand, and we understand that it takes some discernment to understand to get out of that deception because. It does. Normally, you are indoctrinated with a lie from the day that you were born. And then, of course, it is not so easy to accept the truth. And it is like, I think that is a quite famous uh, quotation. Someone said it is easier to believe a lie that has been told a thousand times than the truth that has been told for once. Mm -hmm. And in this system, you don't, right. get, you don't get exposed to the truth so often. Mm -hmm. So that, of course, you are going to reject the truth very often because you are just not used to open yourself up to it. Okay. But anyway, let's uh, start reading on page 83 in the book Code World Babylon, The Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination Today, on the second part of the uh, secret oath of inductions of the Jesuits, on how the oath was made public. The background of how the oath came to be recorded in the congressional records as briefly as follows. And by the way, I mentioned that already yesterday in our last reading on the footnote on page 81. And now we go a little bit deeper into that. Mm 
During the 1912 elections, two candidates ran for a seat in Congress from the 7th Congressional District in Pennsylvania. Eugene C. Barnwell, a Democrat, and Thomas S. Butler, a Republican. Mr. Bonneville, a Catholic and member of the Knights of Columbus, this is, by the way, the American branch of the Knights of Malta, the unsuccessful candidate filed an objection with the Speaker of the House asking that Mr. Butler not be seated to represent the district because, he said, Butler had circulated a falsehood about the oath he took as a member of the Knights of Columbus. This oath meaning the oath of the Knights of Columbus, is widely reported by several ex-Jesuits to be the very one taken by the Jesuits. Mr. Bonneville's objections were investigated by a House Committee on Elections, which submitted a report, House Report 1523, on February 15, 1913. By the way, the same year the Federal Reserve got started. Mm. Upon the request of a congressman, Mr. Olmsted, the report, together with the Jesuit oath, were included in the congressional record. Now, what is the congressional record? The congressional record is virtually a verbatim, a verbatim account of the remarks made by U.S. senators and representatives while debating on the floor of the Senate and the House representatives. In other words, it is a written record of every word that has been spoken there. That's why you have people who are stenographers and yeah. will write down what is taken on. And this is still done today, even with all technical revolution that we have had, because a few years ago, I made a video on the house stenographer who uh, all of a sudden in the house uh, screamed out that the United States was founded by Freemasons. You maybe remember this. Uh, Reed also oh, was the yeah. name. I don't. I don't think I've. I don't. Re I don't recall ever listening to that one of yours, Jörg. Yeah, I have that one on my on my channel too. So there's I'll have even to check a lot that out sometime. To, to discover. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The house stenographer who who then who 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 uh, who uh, who yelled uh, in 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 the, in the Senate that um, the yeah, founding fathers right. were Freemasons. That's yeah. right. I did a video on that for about 15 minutes long or so. It's, it's a few years ago. You can look that up. Yeah. So, But this is still done today. These stenographers are penning down every word that is spoken, officially, of course, yeah? not what the one congressman whispers into the ear of another. That is something that cannot be recorded. But everything that is on record in the Senate or in the Congress is taken into minutes and mm. by stenographers. And yeah. this is what the congressional record is all about. So this, my dear listener, is not a conspiracy theory because it is written down. But of course, it gets very interesting as we read along. Naturally, the author says, the Jesuits deny the oath. Of course, in the same way as they denied the authority of the Secreta Monita and with the same incredulous explanations. Mm -hmm. The reader will right. have ample opportunity to judge for himself. There we go. Your, even, uh, that was authenticity of the secret, secreta monita, right? Instead of authority, right? Oh, yeah, authenticity, authenticity yeah. right. So it is yeah. an authentic document, yes. Yeah. Just quick going to say that. <laughs> okay. The reader will have ample opportunity to judge for himself. But even if this oath were not genuine, referring to what I say at the end of last broadcast and mm. the beginning of this one, mm -hmm. it accords fully, it accords fully with everything the Jesuits have pledged to do in their constitutions, which no Jesuit or any other person can deny, as the constitutions were produced in the French court in 1761. Now, further, the oath accords with all that they have actually done throughout their long history. By their fruits, you will know them. And it gives a true representation of the horrible arts and practices of the sons of Loyola and their students. We see, replicated in the conduct of the Jesuits in all countries, perfect uniformity. 
nay, exact correspondence between their methods and the rules found in this oath supporting the presumption that they operate by these very rules, as the lawyers say, res ipsa loquitur, the thing speaks for itself. Mm. Instructions given before taking the oath. So we were speaking already about what the novice, well, it's not a novice, but what the candidate has to say before he is taken into the ranks of officer, of, of command in the society of Jesus. And now we are speaking about what precedes this. And this is what I'm going to read to you now from page 84. Instructions given before taking the oath. Actually alarming is the lecture of or instructions given to the Jesuits immediately before he takes the extreme oath. The instructions run, quote, My son, and this, by the way, is the superior general speaking to the one who is going to take the oath. Mm -hmm. My son, heretofore you have been taught to act the dissembler among the Roman Catholics, to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy even among your own brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man. Among the reformers, to be a reformer. Among the Huguenots, French Protestants, those were, to be a Huguenot. Among the Calvinists, to be a Calvinist, those are Swiss reformers. Among the Protestants, generally to, generally to be a Protestant, and obtaining their confidence to seek even to preach from their pulpits, and to denounce with all the vehemence in your, uh, in your nature our holy religion and the Pope, and even to descend so low as to become a Jew among the Jews, that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a soldier of the Pope. I just want to go into this little part of the sentence where it says, even to descend so low, as to become a Jew among the Jews. And there's a wonderful example of a Jesuit who descended so low as to become a Jew among the Jews. And this is the so-called Rabbi Ben Ezra, Rabbi Ben Ezra, who you probably know from his work because he wrote a book about uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ, uh, the coming of Jesus Christ in glory. Above, uh, and he wrote that in the, um, uh, under the uh, pseudonym of Rabbi Ben Ezra, and his real name was Lacunza. And he was a Jesuit, and that is a proven fact. So as a disguided Jew, yeah, he descended so low even to become a Jew among the Jews, he wrote a book with the forgering about what will happen when Jesus Christ comes back. And that was the Jesuit Lacunza under the pseudonym of Rabbi Ben Ezra. And you don't have to take my word for it. Look it up for yourself. This is open. Huh? This is an open source. Now, we continue here. You have been taught so insidiously, plant the seeds. Oh, no, I, I have to even say something else. Mm, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I have to, I have right to ahead, say dude. something else. Please. Um, for the moment, I'm getting spammed with comments on a video oh. that I uploaded some yeah. time ago. Um, the second chapter of the book Behind the Dictators from Herbert Leo, Her, uh, Herbert Leo, Le, Her, L.H. Lehman. Yes, that's right. <laughs> um who was a former Catholic and who wrote the book Behind the Dictators. And the second chapter uh, deals with the uh, protocols of the learned elders of Zion. And you should see the shitstorm that I am under mm. with all comments coming into there by saying, um, when, when I reveal during this reading, because this is something that Lehman didn't put that closely into his book, he did not explain who the real author of the uh, of, of the uh, Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion is, mm -hmm. but I know from further research that it was a Jesuit by the name of Abbe Baruel. That's right. And this 
Jesuit forged the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, and they put actually everything that we have read in this oath of the Jesuits, in other words, and put it into the protocols of Zion, and saying that those are the the the, the goals of the Jews who quote unquote ruled the world. Now you can believe that if you want to that the Jews rule the world, but the Jews don't rule anything that they have not given power to by the beast. Because I believe in the very first place the Bible. And the Bible says that there will be from the time of Daniel on four pagan kingdoms that rule over the world. That's right. The first one is the kingdom of Babylon. Then comes the kingdom of Medo-Persia. Then comes the kingdom of Greece. And then comes the kingdom of Rome, which is split in two parts. That's why it is two iron legs. It is pagan Rome and it is papal Rome. And in the time that Jesus walked the earth, Rome was already in power. And that is why Jesus said, these are the last days, because after that kingdom, there is nothing else coming anymore, except, of course, for him who is coming back. So when you understand that, then you know that the Jews don't rule by that. And don't get me wrong, I don't say that there are not some Jews in high positions. Of course they are, because the Jews are often willing Ponzi's. They like to take the blame. Why? Because they like the fame and they like the riches they get from the whore. They sell their soul. Like you have this documentary, they sell their souls for rock and roll. People like to sell their soul yes, for anything. Yes, absolutely because, right. Because people do not have the understanding where is the difference between the spiritual and the temporal. And a lot of people rather have temporally a quote-unquote good life and they don't care for what happens afterwards. And then they sell their souls. And a lot of Jews, of course, are willingly working for the Antichrist in the same way like a lot of Jews were working for Rome in the time of Jesus. Mm -hmm. When the Jews were asked about what kind of king do they have, what did they answer in the time? They said, we have no king but Caesar, right? Right. So what's the difference between the Jews of 2,000 years ago who said that and the Jews that are working in the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church of today? There is no difference. They're all the same. And so, of course, you have people like the Rothschilds and the Warburgs and other people who have Jewish dis of Jewish descent who are very high up in the hierarchy, but eventually they all only work for the papacy. They all only work for, uh, for the Antichrist. And um, there's a little quote that I want to read to you. I just have to look this up here. Just give me a, 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 a second. Um, sure, I have this in one of my documents ahead. here. Mm -hmm. And we are speaking in the Bible then when you open up the book of Luke, yeah, the Gospel of Luke and the New Testament, mm -hmm. and you open up chapter 21 and you read verse 24, it says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, speaking about the Jews, yeah, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, the heathen, the pagans, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Right. And when is the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled? When Jesus Christ comes back. As we can read in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, and mm -hmm. let me just open that up. I have to get to my Bible here. Uh, online, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and it says so um, in the beginning somewhere, I think in verse 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of him, of his coming. Yeah? 
-hmm. That is the time when the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled, when Jesus yes. Christ comes back. That's yes. why Jesus Christ and said... And it says, these, yes, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Yeah. So Satan yeah. comes first, then comes yeah. Jesus. We are going. We are going to make a complete broadcast on Second Thessalonians too. I was oh, planning beautiful. it already. Yeah, that's already right. some some time with Tom Fress, but uh, he, we didn't have the time to come together yet. But this will. Oh um, sure. This will one of these days. Oh, there's no be rush done. on that end, man. Because I know when that comes, sparks are gonna fly. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah, that's good but, though. You know, there is a reason, people, there is a reason why in the introduction of this extreme oath, these instructions read that the prospect of this oath, the prospect of this new officer in the society of Jesus has to even descend so low as to become a Jew among the Jews. They have to make sure that the Jews are staying what they are already since more than 2,000 years, a betrayed people. Yeah. Because if the Jews had not been betrayed at the time of Jesus' first coming, yeah, well, everything would have ended a little bit differently. They maybe would not have given Jesus to the cross, and that, of course, was necessary. So, I mean, it's yeah, all written on beforehand. Right. You cannot change history backwards. No, but no. The, but the point is, the Jews in the time of Jesus' first coming to this earth as a man and fulfilling the 70th week of Daniel completely in his ministry were betrayed people who sold Jesus to the enemy. And this enemy has to make sure that the Jews are being as betrayed now as they were 2,000 years ago because only then his plans can work. Yeah, okay. it's amazing. If you really slow down and think about it, man, it just mind-boggling what's going on in this world. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're... So the instructions continue. You have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between states that were at peace and incite them to deeds of blood, involving them in war with each other, and to create revolutions and civil wars in communities, provinces, and countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences and enjoying the blessings of peace. To take sides with the combatants, to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that which you might be con collected. Only that the church might be the gainer in the end, in the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that the end justifies the means. Now, there is so much said in this little paragraph that we can go on and analyze this for hours. Oh, man. Yeah, and no I, kidding, Jörg. And I just don't want to do that. I want to leave the listeners and the viewers of this video with their own research on that and with their own reflections on this. Mm -hmm. But think about it. When it says here that you have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between states that were at peace and incite them to deeds of blood, involving them in war with each other. I'm just going to give you an example. The Germans and the Russians were always getting along very well. And that, of course, the Roman Catholic Church did not like. So they incite war between those two. They did that in the First World War, and they did that in the Second World War. Yeah. And it says further on, involving them in war with each other and to create revolutions and civil wars in communities, provinces, and countries that were independent and prosperous. Revolutions like, for example, the French Revolution. That was led by the quote-unquote Illuminati that was only a front organization for the at that time officially banished Jesuit order. 
and civil wars in communities, provinces, and countries. Well, you in the United States of America, you expected, uh, you experienced a civil war in the 1860s. Yeah, and that yeah, war. That's right. And that war, even your president Lincoln said, would not have been possible without the sinister, sinister involvement of the Jesuit order. That's right. That's what he said himself. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to go any more into picking this little um, paragraph piece by piece into, into pieces and explain every little word. But I want to give you these little advices that I just taught, this little starting points. And then when you, when, we go, when you go back and you analyze all the wars that have been in the world, why do you think all these wars are coming? I mean, even the uh, Korean and the Vietnam War dividing the country into north and south all of a sudden. What, what is that? Did the people do that? Did the people really want that? Or was that a Jesuit agenda, as well as in Korea, as it was in Vietnam at that time? That's a great question to ask. And when you, when you do your own research, you will see the hidden hand mm -hmm. behind these operations. And mm -hmm. that is the hidden hand of the Jesuits. And you don't need me to tell you that, or you don't need Brett to tell you that. Mm -hmm. You can come to that by your own when you have the information as it is given to you in this book, Cold World Babylon, about the secret oath of the Jesuits. The only real problem with it is, is that you're going to run into a lot of flack when you discover what the Jesuits really are and what they're you know what what are the implications of this oath you know you you're going to find that historically in the united states the institutions of learning hid all this information yeah and you're not going to like it no as i said you have been betrayed from cradle to grave yeah that's it that's it yep so it's uh, it's pretty painful to come into uh, studying all this information and verifying it, but I'll tell you, it's very important. If you want to be without deception, then you must earn it. You must earn that position. It's not something that just comes. You have to work at it. Yeah, and you have to rely on God's grace to lead you into all truth. And yes. in the Bible, it is said already that the truth will set you free. Yes, that's right. And what does what will the truth set you free of? Well, the truth that you will gain by reading books like this, and of course, first of all, the Bible and understanding the Bible and God's word, the truth that they will set you free with is that you will all of a sudden have a peace you will have no fear anymore. You can look at everything that comes in this world as a tsunami and you are being a spectator a hundred miles high and watching it because it doesn't concern you anymore. Mm -hmm. Because it takes you literally out of this world. As Jesus said, you have to live in this world, but don't be of the world. Of course, we have to live in it, but therefore, I don't have to be of it. Right. All this political theater they throw at us, mm -hmm. whether it's in the United States or of America, it is in Korea, it is here in Europe, everywhere. I mean, in yeah. Germany, they yeah. have since That's months right. no, no, no government and all that stuff. I mm -hmm. don't care for all that. I, I was speaking with Perry, the, 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 my, my Dutch brother in Christ. Uh, a few days ago, and he said mm -hmm. in one of his videos that he doesn't even know if that Maxima or whatever is still a princess or even the queen of uh, of Netherlands any, uh, anymore. He he doesn't even know that. Like I don't know who is the king of Belgium, and I don't care. Or who is right. the vice? Who is the who is the min uh, prime minister of this country? I right. don't care. Right. Let them have their theater. That's all in this world. I don't care for that because the truth with which Jesus Christ has made me free puts me above this. Yes, that's right. It does. Yep, and the people here in America think that you have to vote for this candidate or vote for that candidate or else you're not being a proper citizen and doing your duty, your civic duty. Well, if you figured out that the civil powers, the beast of revelation, 
in that you know we're this 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 nation the united states is the second beast of revelation chapter 13 <laughs> what are you doing spending all this time and energy on this crap i'm sorry i'm not gonna i'm not touching it anymore i'm done too yerk i'm done you're, with it you're being dragged into patriotism yes, from the very it. moment that you are born waving your flags of the United States of America on the 4th of July, mm -hmm. standing in school and singing um, the home and the, uh, the this is the home of the uh, of the brave and I don't the know. Free you know the, brave, this, yeah. the free and the brave Land and the stars the and stripes yeah. stuff and all, and all, all that, that stuff. stuff yeah. and, 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 you know, waving the flag when the soldiers go back on another crusade, which you don't understand, yeah. that the American military never ever in its history has been there to defend the uh, freedom of the citizens of the United States of America, yep. but only fighting the crusades of the Antichrist. Yeah, that's and, the problem. Course, Americans, they just want to be entertained. Don't you yes. see? Entertainment is the problem. Yeah, that is the, is the problem. problem. Once you stop entertaining yourself, start studying. And it's way, way, way more interesting than entertainment. Entertainment is a waste. It's for fat, lazy people. Sorry, but that's the truth. You want to be a sloth? That. Then go ahead and enjoy your television. I can't argue with that. I'm sick by the of way, it. By the way, when you are going about um, the television... Um, you know what entertainment actually means? Oh, yeah, that's right. To contain. <laughs> wait, wait a second. I, was, uh, I wanted to look this up here. Please go ahead. I'll be right back. I'm just going to the stove here. Okay. Um, well, then I have to look the other way in this document, and it has to go upwards. Um, what does entertainment mean? You know, this is about the television that also, of course, entertains us. And you have to break this word down. This is what etymology does, you know, the study of words. Entertainment is a word that consists of three syllables. Mm -hmm. To enter, to enter, to tain, and to ment. Now, enter means to come in. Yes. To be invited into. Tain means to possess or hold on to possession. And ment means to keep in the state of mind that you're in mentally. Means to keep you in that mentally possessed uh, possession at that moment. And that's what you do when you, for example, turn on your television. Mm -hmm. You are being entertained. You let the spirit, the satanic spirit of the television in you invite him in you are getting possessed while you are watching this this is actually people say this is brainwashing it is um uh, how do you say that um yeah yeah there's there's another word for that uh i know uh, it, it was interesting uh when we had a bible study some months ago tom was saying that the television is basically just the spiritual exercises i mean it's just a mass marketed way of of indoctrinating people into the spiritual exercises and the more i think about it the more i am in full agreement with that statement yeah he's absolutely right when he says yeah. that yeah. yeah, ratio studiorum, right? It all yeah. works its way around. And that Jesuit uh, ratio studiorum really has uh, a great deal to do with, with this type of quote-unquote entertainment. Hypnotized. You are hypnotized when mm -hmm. you are watching the television. That is the word oh, that I was Oh, and even for. just making music, Yerk, when I make songs... I'm hypnotizing myself. It's hypnotizing. It's it can be dangerous. Yes. It can be very dangerous. It can be very Absolutely. dangerous. Yes. That's why I don't go around making music videos very often, you know. Once in a while it's fun, but 
there's definitely got to be some moderation to it. Yeah. So the point is, what does this word entertainment mean? To come in, to be invited in, you are inviting the satanic spirit, a fallen spirit, a fallen angel, a demon, to take possession of you, to hold on and maintain in your mind and to keep you in that state of mind that you're in eventually at that moment. Because when you watch television, you are not thinking for yourselves. You are getting entertained. And therefore, you have to break down and understand this word entertainment. But let's go on for a little reading in this book, as long as we still have a little time to go before sure, we hit the please. hour again. Yeah. But I, I, I think that everything that we said here today is very profound and, and, and has to be understood and that you have to take it all together. You have to take the study of the book that we are reading together with what we are saying here and, of course, measure it all to the Word of God, to the Bible. And then you will come to the full understanding that we intend to give you. Right. Because we are doing this because we love you. Yes, That's and if something doesn't you. match up and you need to say it, just comment. It's no problem. It's yeah. no problem, especially when the comments are biblically, you know, in line. Sola Scriptura, we love that. You know, there's nothing better than learning something we didn't know. You know, maybe we're not aware of something. Maybe, you know, someone has something instructive to say. That's what I wanted to say. You know, that's really, those kind of comments are the kind of comments I just love, but they don't happen too often. <laughs> <laughs> no, I very rarely get a comment that I can learn something of, I actually yeah. have to admit. Yeah, no. it's true, sadly. Anyway, the author continues, So a person may be a Jesuit, and yet act and speak as if, quote, openly opposed to that which he, quote, might be connected, unquote, while acting secretly in concert with a brother Jesuit. Now, this last part that we just read here, yeah, I'm going to uh, I'm going to repeat that one. To take sides with the combatants, to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that with which you might be connected. Only that the church be the gainer in the end, in the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that the end justifies the means. So when we go back to that political theater that we were going to, I didn't make my finish my point there, and Brett didn't either. When you have on the one hand the Republicans and on the other hand, for example, the Democrats, and both are led by the Jesuits, they, own, they both have their own agenda, but in the end, they are working for the same goal that the church is the gainer in the end. Whatever the outcome, whether a Democrat wins or a Republican wins, who will always win is the one that pulls the strings behind, and that is the church, so that the church might be the gainer in the end. And you have that, of course, in your political world, in the United States of America. You have that in Germany with all the different parties we have over there. We have that here in Belgium with all the different parties over here. Mm -hmm. But you also have that internationally. Mm -hmm. And that is how these quote-unquote alliances are formed, where then later on comes war from. Sure, that makes sense. <clears throat> so that, for example, you know, maybe you don't know, but then you have to study that, the USSR, the revolution of the Bolsheviks, has been paid for by the same people that were leading capitalist America at the same time. They were playing both sides of the story. And Russia was financed by the same guys, and Germany was financed by the same guys, and America was financed by the same guys, and England was financed by the same guys, and then they had the cataclysm at the end, putting it all together, war. And in this war, the Jews were killed, the Protestants were killed, the Orthodox were killed, everyone who was opposing the church. So, sometimes you say, yeah, but Hitler was good because he did this and this, or Stalin was good because he did this and this, 
or Mussolini was good because he did this and this, or Roosevelt was good because he did this and this, but you have to see the overall agenda. You have to get out of the system to identify the system as a system. And this is what is taught here, mm -hmm. that when you are a Jesuit, you will get your marching orders, and you don't have to question your marching orders. You do what you are told as a obedient corpse without any thinking of yourself. And you will do this even in opposition to the guy who is on the other hand, even though he is like you, a Jesuit. You know, this is like mm -hmm. uh, in America, you get this uh, crazy kind of sport that's called wrestling, right? Right. When it comes to the TV shows, these guys clash at each other and break each other's necks and bones mm -hmm. and I don't know what. And what you don't see is when the show is done, they take each other in the arm and go drink a beer together. Right. And visit each other at their own at their homes, you know, best mm -hmm. friends. Right. It's all a show. Ratio studiorum. That's what the right. Jesuits invented and perfected with Medici learning and the ratio studiorum system that they put on here. And therefore, it is very interesting to read this book and to understand that in the oath already, in the, in the instructions before the oath is taken, it is said to take sides with the combatants to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit who might be engaged on the other side. What is that? Treason, right? Absolutely. When you're on the one side and you act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit who might be engaged on the other side, that's treason. And you know all the American presidents, whenever they take the oath of inauguration, they always swear that they will defend the United States of America of every enemy from without and within. They are the enemy from within. That is something that you have to understand. Mm -hmm. Now the instructions continue. You have been taught your duty as a spy to gather all statistics, facts and information in your power from every source, every source, to ingratiate yourselves into the confidence of the family circle of Protestants and heretics of every class and character, as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, among the schools and universities, in parliament and legislatures, and in the judiciaries, judiciaries and councils of state, and to be all things to all men, for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. You have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as a coadjutor. These are Jesuit degrees. Confessors and priests, you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola and in the service of the Pope. You must serve as the instrument and executioner as directed by your authority, by your superiors. For none can command here who has not consecrated his labors with the blood of the heretics. For, quote, without the shedding of blood, no man can be saved, unquote. And this is, of course, how the Jesuits turned this around. Without the shedding of the blood of Protestants, of the sworn enemies of the Jesuits, no man can be saved. Yeah, this is how they twist the word of God, who says, without the shedding of blood, no man can be saved. But there, of course, it was referring to the Levitical law in the Old Testament and the shedding of blood of innocent animals by just accepting the spiritual way of thinking that with the shedding of their blood, your sins may be washed away. Right. And then, right. of course, with Jesus Christ, who was then taking over the, the, so. the position of the lambs and who was becoming the perfect lamb. And by yeah. his blood, all uh, sins were washed away. So the Jesuits still deny the 
the sacrifice of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ shed the blood, his blood for all of us, therefore that we could be saved. But the Jesuits, of course, twist that in their oath. Yes, because they claim power over Christ. They deny Jesus Christ. They, they deny yeah, that Jesus right. Christ has come and fulfilled the Levitical law and that Jesus Christ is the Savior and is the Messiah of that's all right. mankind. And they that's deny right. all that. And this little sentence here is absolute proof of that. Yes, it is. Because it was Jesus Christ who was the ultimate sacrifice. Yep, that's right. And, and it, just like we were studying yesterday, shadows of things to come here, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's another thing, yeah. Yeah, that's another okay. thing. <laughs> now, the book continues. So ends the induction of the Jesuit. At maiorem dei gloriam, which stands for, for the greater glory of God. What is more to be feared, dear reader? A mad dog like Hitler? A member of Al-Qaeda who pours open hatred upon our heads? or a representative of the Society of Jesus with his secret vials of wrath and death brood in the cellars of the Vatican. And it is not just Jesuit priests who take such oaths. Oh, no, 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 no. John Campbell, who was educated for the priesthood, used to say he dared not have taken the degrading and wicked oaths imposed on a confessor, unquote. This is what we can read in uh, Edward A. Sherman's book, The Engineer Corpse of Hell. Mm. As some, out of a mistaken sense of charity, may be tempted to believe that the Jesuits have reformed and are no longer what they were in their early days, let it be remembered that these instructions and their oath were still in use in 1913. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the same assumption that a lot of people do when they say, well, the Roman Catholic Church has changed. They don't uphold the same dogma they did in the Council of Trent in the 1560s. Oh, no, they man. still do, because in the Second Vatican Council in 1963 through 1965, they confirmed everything That's that was right. said in the Council That's of right. Trent in, fifth, in, the 16, <clears throat> uh, in the 16th century. Huh? Right. The and Roman Catholic... To add to that, to, just add in that Latin phrase, semper Adam. Semper Adam, yeah. That's the right. The church never changes, the always the same. Never, always the same. Yeah. yeah. That's right. So, and we have no reason to believe that they are not used today, as they were used in 1913, of course, because they have never renounced it. Let none imagine for a moment that these fanatical Jesuitical doctrines of killing kings and statesmen were meant to slumber in forgotten volumes somewhere in a Vatican cellar. These are active, living principle of the Pope's militia. It is their very catechism. It is their gasoline. We do not exaggerate when we say that in Jesuitism we find extolled the most iniquitous maxims the most murderous instructions, the most frightful weapons for the accomplishment of their objective. Quote, that is to say, the use of falsehood and murder, the special weapons and characteristics of the prince of evil, where such arts as these failed them, they had recourse to violence. Regarding such proceedings, many volumes have been written, unquote. So says Griesinger in his book, The Jesuits, which is published in 1866 in German and in English, and which will be my next side project in German to read. And when I ever have the time, I will also read um, Theodor Griesinger's book, The Jesuits, in English. But I'm not sure if I will ever come to that, but I'm sure that I will do that in German. So when you're watching this and you understand German, then keep an eye on my channel because in German there are coming a lot of videos on the Inquisition and on the Jesuits in the future. The sons of Loyola, though they speak with gentle words and eloquent tongues, have horned thoughts. After shaking their hands, count your fingers. <laughs> Quote, if anyone slumbers when a Jesuit is within reach, writes one author, it should be with one eye open. Unquote. If you think that these utterances are the rhetoric of spite, 
I assure you that the portrait will soon become more definite and convincing in the details of life. Like the Lord Don Quixote, it is the solemn determination of every Jesuit that which was recorded of Amadeus de Gaulle, quote, if he did not achieve great things, at least he died in attempting them. He feats, he feats of Amadeus uh, initiate me in the imitation of your fame. I will follow his example, unquote. This comes from Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, Il in Ignacio Hidalgo Don Quixote de la Mancha. Don Quixote de la Mancha. You have to understand La Mancha is the region in Spain where the Sierra Nevada is, south of, uh, south of Madrid. And um, this history of Don Quixote, the uh, quote-unquote the lost knight or the poor knight, as it is always, uh, always told, is actually a story, when you understand it correctly, about the Jesuits and the general of the Jesuits. It's a parable. Yeah? Mm. And this is why P.D. Stewart mentions this here. So, but uh, Brett, I see we have become a little bit above the hour. Yes, and, uh, right. Then we will probably <laughs> leave the rest of the pages. Uh, we still right. have uh, two and a half pages to go until the end of the chapter. We will leave that for the next reading, I guess. And yeah, we we're just getting warmed up, man. This is really getting, getting hot, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, is. it is. It's getting hot. So, well, should we close it up, Jörg? Yeah, yeah. For me, it's for me, it's okay. It has been quite uh, interesting and it's very intense, of course. Again, um, even though that I do not prepare for these readings, and I know that you don't either. No, I don't. This no. is this is what everything that we say in these readings that comes not directly from the book when it is just read um, is not scripted and is just where the spirit leads us and um, where the spirit gives us the message for you guys to help you to help you see through the system, to help you three, uh, see through the deception and to come to the truth with which you have been made free by Jesus Christ. This is the only truth that counts. And here in this earth, you will never find peace except the peace that you will receive when you find the truth which is in, which is in Jesus Christ. That's then you right. will have peace. And here in this earth can happen whatever wants. It doesn't concern you. Yeah. You have to separate yourself from this. Live in the world, but don't be of the world. And make a very, in, uh, very intelligent discernment between the spiritual and the carnal. And understand that we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in high places. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18 put on the whole armor of God. And with that, I'm going to leave you until next time. And Brett can do the finishing words of this broadcast. Thanks for watching, listening. Until next time, Jogla 66 from our of the Truth signs off. And bye-bye. Thank you, Yerk. That was a wonderful reading we did today, a reflection of uh, some of the more difficult aspects of this political and uh, spiritual union of the Jesuit oath that we are uh, having to suffer through in this life. So with that, we're closing it down for today, and we're looking forward to the next recording, and we'll see you then. Hope to see you then. And God bless you, and take care. Bye-bye.